Bernie, um, introducing Professor Bernie Lowe, who will be um, running our next session uh, for our IOM committee. Bernie? I'll, uh, Great. Thank you. May I ask uh, Artie Rye, uh, Ida Soon, and Joanne Maltrecker to come up, take a seat, and Jeff Drazen, will he appear on our screen magically? Uh, as you can somebody help me get my slides up here? Are you doing that? Oh, you can do that. Okay. I was going to, this is all about data. I just shared some data on time, which is an objective measure, and we were an hour off. So it's being corrected as we speak. Uh, one of the challenges being a moderator at IOM or NAM panels is to try and keep on schedule, and particularly when things slip further and further behind. So these are members of the 2015, at the time, Institute of Medicine panel on sharing clinical tri trial data. And we're going to continue the theme of progress and triumphs. So we're going to sort of pat ourselves on the back and pat other members of the uh, panel and the audience uh, who uh, are here. Uh, and we're also going to look to the future. What are the remaining challenges? What needs to be done? So we're going to start by having each of the panelists in turn. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm going to start with some slides, if I can get them up on my screen here. Uh, I'm going to just quickly review for you. I'm going to just quickly review the recommendations of the uh, 2015 report. So how do I advance the slides? Clicker? And then you have to speak directly into OK. So I boiled down our recommendations. Uh, the first was that stakeholders, that's all of you in the room, researchers, research funders and sponsors, patient advocates, leaders of institutions that do research, all of you uh, were asked to create a culture where data sharing is the expected norm. And you can ask yourself where that succeeded and where it still needs some work. We made very detailed recommendations on sharing various types of data at different points in time after the completion of a clinical trial. And we were really asking for sharing of the analytic, analyzable data set that supports published fundings uh, from a trial. And we really called the, for sharing the protocol, the data analysis plan, and the analytic code, as well as just the top level results. And the goal was to allow use of de-identified individual patient data for new discoveries. And I think we should ask ourselves, have those new discoveries come to pass? What can we do to make such data more, more useful? We also had a vision eight years ago for what clinical trial data, data sharing should look like. One. There should be sustainable platforms, multiple platforms for data sharing with a variety of access models and use models. Two, and Vivli is only one of many examples of that kind of uh, data sharing platform. There should be adequate financial support for data sharing and fair, fair allocation of costs of data sharing between the trial generators and the trial users. So those of you doing clinical trials can raise the question, is there adequate financial support for that data sharing? And are the data generators being asked to bear an unfair proportion of the cost of data sharing? We hope to reduce dis disincentives for data sharing and to minimize the risks to individual participants. How have we done there? What can we do in the future? We called for the identification of best practices in data sharing uh, and sharing those best practices and using them in ways to improve data sharing more generally. 
And are we doing enough there? Have we done enough? What can we do to make it better? So now I'm going to turn to the uh, four panelists, ask each of them, each member of that 2015 committee, to um, quickly, in about two or three minutes, uh, say what they think was the most meaningful recommendation from that 2015 report. And then, more importantly, what needs to be done now to fulfill the recommendation? So uh, why don't we start alphabetically? Artie, right, from Duke. I won't read all your accolades. You want to go first? And again, I'm going to ask everybody to be brief. So. Hello and good morning. Um, thanks to Bernie and to Vivli and to the academies for inviting me to this terrific event. And I'll just offer, as, as Bernie said, two or three minutes of brief reflections and comments. I think, I'm not sure that I have an answer to which was the most significant recommendation. I think all of them were very significant. So I'll, I'll uh, praise all of them, I suppose, in, in a, a somewhat self-congratulatory fashion. I will, however, talk about um, what a theme that's already come up quite a bit today and I think is going to continue to come up, which is that the promise and peril of clinical trial data sharing and data sharing more generally, but particularly um, since we're here, clinical trial data sharing is accentuated by machine learning. And we talked about the benefits of greater access to greater amounts of data uh, quite a bit in the 2015 report, but we didn't know there would be so much immediately thereafter with respect to machine learning um, in, in terms of the, the ability to have the computing power to do these wonderful things um, through graphical processor units and so forth. So, um, you know, we all know now, well, many of us have, have been following what may be some hype, but is also probably true that um, machine learning can be used to do better optimization of clinical trials and better comparative effectiveness studies. Um, to decipher new indications based on past prior data and do better subgroup analysis. And so whether that takes away too much from creating original clinical trial data is, is an, an open question. I think it's important, but it's, that's, that's, I think, a really key technological development. I'm so glad we'll have a separate panel on, on technological developments that have changed things in the risk and benefit calculus, because I think, as I said, ma machine learning has made things um, um, in the benefits much greater, but also the risks greater. Um, so I'm just going to say a couple of things. Um, I'm a, a law professor, and um, so I don't pretend to either be a technologist or a clinical trialist, but I'm going to talk a little bit about how I thought the, the report was very good on thinking about incentives um, in the what, what lawyers would call the soft law arena, so encouraging data sharing platforms like Vivli, which have done incredibly great things, um, to uh, to create the the um, infrastructure, if you will, for clinical trial data sharing, and to interoperate with other platforms like Import and Project Datasphere that may have slightly different approaches to data sharing, but nonetheless, we can make these different data use approaches interoperable. And I think that's really exciting. I was really excited to read some of the approved projects and what people are up to. It seems that a lot of progress is being made on data reuse and that's really, really exciting. Also really exciting to see that there are some of the private sponsors um, who were, uh, I'd say, 10 years ago, much more resistant to data sharing, even to the point of tangling with the EMA about it. So AbbVie is participating, Lilly, Pfizer, Regeneron, Sanofi, you all know this, so I won't go on. But I do think that it shows the promise of data use agreements to deal with issues like privacy and security, confidential information, scope of data use, ownership of the the secondary work product, which is an interesting question that we can get into uh, in the Q&A if, if, if we like. Um, so that's very exciting. Um, in terms of um, one of the things that Bernie asked about, the, the North Star, what are we looking for in the next frontier? 
I would say that it would be great to see more private firm sponsors working together with one another. Um, that That is, I think, a, a really interesting idea to try to push forward. We have a lot of academics working on this data, but it would be great to see private firm sponsors working together with one another and maybe federated approaches, which are even more protective of commercially confidential information, are the answer. I'd also love to see more data on abandoned drugs because, as uh, Rob Califf pointed out, I do think that abandonments and failures are actually even more important than successes in terms of moving the, the needle forward in collective knowledge. And I'd love to see more of that because there are so many disincentives to sharing negative results and failure. No one wants to talk about their failures. Um, I'll just move really quickly to hard law. I'm um, excited to see that we have both FDA and NIH here. Hard law from the perspective of a lawyer is considered stuff that you have to obey. You're not just incentivized to obey it, but it's, it's a stick, not just a carrot. And I'm excited to see that NIH is doing some of that. Maybe they will, in fact, this time around, um, as we probably know, some of us, um, the, their uh, f forcing of data sharing has not been as successful in the past as might be ideal, so hopefully things will be better going forward. Um, I do think that FDA and EMA could probably do more on the hard law side, and I can talk about that in Q&A, but I do think that there is an ability to get CSRs and maybe even individual patient data out there through the FDA process, the EMA process. Um, some of that has been slowed down by Brexit and by uh, COVID, but I do think there's some opportunities. So with that, I will stop. I probably went over three minutes. I apologize for that, um, but um, thank you so much once again. Thanks very much, Hardy. It's important for those of us who are not lawyers to think about hard law versus soft law incentives. Uh, next, I'm going to turn to Jeff Drazen, who we all know, who's sporting uh, his usual uh, not so colorful but quite elegant bow tie. Jeff, we miss you and uh, hope you and your, your, your wife are well. Go ahead. The floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Bernie. And uh, by way of full disclosure, I wanted to let everybody know that I actually serve as an unpaid advisor to the Vividly External Advisory Board. Um, I think it's an awesome operation, and I encourage all of you that have the opportunity to submit or use their data to do so. Now, I think if we look back uh, since the I IOM at that time report, there have been good news and bad news. The good news is that a lot of things that people feared would happen haven't happened. There haven't been a lot of secondary analyses uh, of data sets uh, taking dispute with published findings. I think one of the concerns of many investigators was that uh, data sets would become available, people would reanalyze them in a statistically uh, not so perfect way, come up with a conclusion that was at odds with the published conclusions and try to draw away from that finding uh, that was in a published material uh, suggestions that it was incorrect or not as widely applicable as people had thought. Now, there may be examples of this, which of which I don't know, but there certainly haven't been lots of examples, so much to the point where people could say this is a widespread concern. So I think that concern has been mitigated by the process of time. It just didn't happen. The second thing that could have happened that didn't happen so far is with sharing data sets, uh, people have not found that secondary publications are coming from groups not associated with the primary acquisition of the data. One of the concerns was that, and it was a reasonable concern, that hundreds, if not thousands of person hours went into getting the data in terms of recruiting the patients, doing the interventions, gathering the outcomes, uh, and that although there would be a primary um, article or publication, there could be many subsequent publications from it. But if the data set were open, people could dive into these data sets and begin to publish data from them before the people who were actually the primary gatherers of those data had a chance to fully analyze them and uh, use them in publication. Now, that has probably happened some, but again, it hasn't become a widespread problem. So two fears uh, that were out there, as far as I can tell, um, were not realized. So to quote FDR, the fear of being fear itself, that fear is probably not worrisome. Uh, then 
The next thing is that the good news is that pharma has been very good. When you look at the data sets that are in Vivli and other places, large fractions of these are from uh, pharmaceutical trials, which is what drives uh, current clinical practice. Clinical practice is changing all the time, and uh, both pharma and device trials are important in that. And uh, the data from those trials is uh, available. What I don't know from Vivli and would love to hear about is the fraction of those trials where there have been requests for data, where the data uh, people providers have said, no, you can't have it. Um, and as an external advisory board member, this topic for discussion hasn't come up in any detail, but my sense is that it hasn't um, happened a lot. And I would uh, like to know from the Vivli people the extent to which requests for data are being turned away uh, because of some sort of fear of misuse of the data. So then uh, that's one side of it. The bad news is that uh, academics are still not contributing data uh, to these data sources as much as they could. Now, I think that the new NIH rules will likely change this. And this is a, a simple matter of who pays the fiddler calls the tune. NIH trials are good because they're usually designed in an unbiased way to answer an important clinical question. The problem has been um, to get the data out there as soon as possible. And I think that um, academics just don't have the resources, the financial resources, the technical resources, and the desire to get the data out there. They don't see it as, at this point, clearly in their best interest to do so. Some of the other panels that will be uh, going over today will be discussing this point in detail. But I think it's one that we need to think about if we're going to get more widespread data sharing to occur. In general, I'm encouraged. Uh, journals have only asked for data sharing plans. And that was because uh, when this all started four or five years ago, we didn't think the wherewithal was out there to actually get the data shared easily. At this point, we believe that it's begin time to begin to think about the ways to require investigators to share data before they can publish it. And with that kind of requirement, as opposed to just telling us what you're planning on doing, which is the current state of the art, but rather a requirement for sharing, I think we'll be able to make progress. Thank you, and I look forward to further discussion. Thanks very much, Jeff. Going through the alphabet, um, Ida Sim, you're up next. Great, thank you, <clears throat> and uh, so happy to be here. Um, <clears throat> Well, from the um, original um, panel, I think um, uh, the successes that I've seen <clears throat> have been the recommendation for platforms and how to configure those platforms, and I think we have been successful with that. Uh, Vivli, just one of several, of course, the NIH uh, generalized uh, repository ecosystem initiative showing that uh, eco that platforms are working together. Uh, so I, I think that has been a, 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 a big move forward. Um, and the, the norms have changed, I think. there's. Um, much less a discussion of, of whether, but it's really, really moved on to the how, right, as we're hearing today. So make some comments about the, the how, and, and um, uh, I think it's Jeff's um, uh, statement about um, is the juice worth the squeeze, and I think that's still an open question. I'll address some of that. <laughs> right. um, first of all, in terms of um, individual investigators, totally agree that academia is having a hard time sharing. Uh, whether it's individual investigators wanting to share, I think it's just the practicalities are extremely daunting. And I think going to Dan Ford's comment about uh, you know investigators wanting to get into clinical trials, having this additional burden, especially if it's required uh, to share at the end of the study without institutional support, it's I think really a no-go in this climate. So what are academic institutions doing to support data sharing? Um, I think whether academic institutions take it as an institutional responsibility to support the infrastructure, I think is still an open question. Uh, I'll tell you right now that you know we're all thinking about 
big data and GPUs and AI. It's not about the infrastructure for data sharing, which is, which is very challenging. Um, it's not just randomized clinical trials, it's also other kinds of human studies, qualitative studies, social science studies, uh, so it's a, it's a broader issue. Um, one of the, the concrete challenges for an institution is how to handle de-identification. Um, just simply understanding that the identification is a spectrum, it's not a black and white, just even something as simple as that. I think having the, the legal people, the policy people, and then the technical people think about how to think about the identification, the costs involved with that, thinking about potential technical approaches like synthetic data, uh, those are all complex issues that are very hard for, for, I think, for most academic institutions to wrap their head around and come up with a solid policy and support for investigators to do effective data sharing sort of on the fly as policies evolve. So I, I will lay that out as, as challenges for sure. I think to the extent that we can show the benefit of data sharing, the scientific benefits, um, to, to show that juice, that's really important. <clears throat> And actually, it's been really hard to squeeze that juice out of the fruit, right? The data is there, um, as, as, uh, as Commissioner Caleb said, the data from randomized trials are better and better. But even so, it's still really hard to really find the data, find what the data is about, combine the data. It's a special skill set. Um, and and um, the, the promise of AI and ML is perhaps to democratize that, right? That's the, that's the promise. So we're familiar with the FAIR principles, findable, accessible, interoperable, reusable. <clears throat> I think large language models and generative AI, we'll get a little bit into that in the panel later today, uh, specifically around findability and accessibility because generative AI is about natural language and you know us being humans, much easier to, to, um, to interact with natural language. So findable and accessible, I think those would be the, the earlier wins. Interoperable, reusable, that's still very, very hard. And, and whether LLMs can help with that, um, I think that's a promise, but it's a wide open research area, really a wide open area. So a um, lot of promise there, but, but it's very early. So I think our North Star, um, I'd like to see us do the better squeezing, if we can torture that metaphor. Um, uh, I think the, the, the platform with traditional RCTs, I think um, some guideposts I think that we can, we can follow, a lot, a lot of work to do. Um, I think the big wide open area is real world evidence. More and more of the evidence that drives our actions is gonna come from real world evidence. And because we, don't, we can't even wrap our arms around it, um, it's, hard, it's hard to think that one through. And as the locus of evidence generation is moving that target for data sharing and target, re target for, for the benefits of data reuse is moving. It's moving very fast. Um, and that's a wide open area. Uh, I'm not even sure it's on the map in terms of a true north. Thanks. Thanks very much, Ida. Uh, Joanne Waldstreicher, our cleanup hitter. <laughs> Thanks so much. <laughs> Uh, thanks for including me. It's really great to be with people who we worked so closely together for so long. Um, I do want to say I have some affiliations that could present a conflict of interest, so please uh, check the, the background material if you'd like. But I want to say I'm speaking on behalf of myself today. Um, let me just first reflect on what I think were um, the most meaningful parts of the report for pharma. And I think really setting the standard that sharing clinical trial data was the default position, that this was the new culture and this is what we would do. I think that actually was the most meaningful part of the report. Um, and as, as I think it was said several times today, the, the large pharma companies have by and large not just put an effort here, but actually put in groups together and are spending significant resources and people behind the data sharing effort. And I think that that's been a, a tremendous change over the past several years. Um, I think the report also set out important guardrails, which were which really helped maintain the innovation ecosystem. And so as an example, making sure that the requirement for data sharing <clears throat> was after regulatory approval. 
I think was a very important guardrail for the pharmaceutical industry to be sure that the FDA and EMA had a quiet period, quote unquote, which is in the report. And is this coming across okay when speaking? Okay. To make sure that that quiet period, because the FDA, for example, does their own independent analyses of the data, really delves in, does inspections, be, make sure of the quality and the veracity of the data, and then oftentimes asks for additional analyses. Um, and sometimes doesn't approve it on the first go round. So there's multiple, sometimes delays in approval. And so I think that was one of the most important guardrails that was laid out. A second very important guardrail, and I think that this will go to my second part, which is kind of what we can learn from what industry has done and take it to as we continue data sharing even more broadly, is that the very important guardrail was that the requirement was that you had to share phase two, three, and four randomized clinical trial data, but not phase one clinical trial data in healthy volunteers. And there are many, many very small phase one studies that are done. And if we had had to share those data, that would have been a very large burden, very little juice for a large squeeze. And I think that that's an important lesson to think about as the NIH and academia moves forward with data sharing, is to think about whether there are guardrails and uh, different types of clinical trials that you can predefine and say, you know, these do not have to be shared, that we should focus more on the more meaningful studies that have more impact on uh, clinical medicine. Um, just reflecting on some of the benefits that as industry, and I actually got together with several uh, colleagues from across many companies, and we talked about this together. I think the biggest benefit is that we feel we've taken a step forward in terms of trust and transparency and demonstrating our commitment to contributing to science. It's that we've been able to contribute to science, and also we've given the participants who participate in clinical trials, a greater opportunity for their data to contribute to science outside of just a company, outside of just contributing to the development of a product. They're able to contribute to the broader uh, world of science, and we think that that's significant. Um, just speaking now for the Yoda experience that um, I've had, which was the, the Yale um, open, open Data Access Program together with Johnson & Johnson, um, there have been in the 10 years about over 100 papers that have been published from the data that we've shared. And Jeff, just to answer the question that you've asked before, I can't speak for everyone in Vivli, but I can say that over 95% of the requests that we've gotten, that Yale has gotten in Yoda and that we've provided data for once they've approved, over 95% of the requests have been approved. Um, the second benefit is I think we've increased the bar, both with the data sharing, guidelines as well as with the publication guidelines which preceded this. I think we've increased the bar, especially in this, Rob mentioned this, for post-approval studies. Pre-approval studies are very, you know, hyper-evaluated. They're re-examined and re-analyzed by the regulatory agencies, especially the FDA, which does a complete reanalysis themselves of the, of the participant level data. Um, but the post-approval studies are not always uh, scrutinized in the same way. And so by, by raising the bar and by the industry knowing that if you're going to do a study, you're committed to publish it and sharing those data, I think raise the bar because what you know might be examined is always something that you give a little bit more attention to. And I think that that's been helpful for the whole um, medical ecosystem. And finally, several of my colleagues shared that the data sharing policies for external data sharing have really shaped their internal data sharing policies so that there's a lot more care given across teams. You know, it's not just there's data and anyone can access it. There's a lot more guidance and guidelines and policies about internal data sharing to be sure that we're honoring our commitments to the participants in the study and being good stewards of data and privacy. I just want to reflect on a couple of very important lessons that um, I've taken away from um, being in pharma for over 30 years and then working over the past 10 years in the data sharing environment, especially with Yoda, but also with Vivli. I think one of the biggest lessons is that with Yoda, and this is all public information, it's all online, I looked this morning, about a third of the applications of the requests for data 
really um, required some sort of scientific input from the scientific review process that Yoda has for review of the proposals. Not every data sharing platform has that, but Yoda has that. And um, I think that that's very important. Rob mentioned this morning the issue with VARES. You know, it's a data dump and people can do anything with the data and just report, you know, so the, this number of people died after getting this vaccine. You know, that they saw this in VARES and there's all kinds of misinformation without looking at, for example, you know, how many people would have died in that period anyway. How old were those people, et cetera. And I think that um, that's something to be thought about as we move forward and that and there's even more data that might be shared publicly. Could there be some scientific review of the proposals, which has two benefits. Number one, obviously the scientific review, but number two, it, it's the requirement that there's a pre definition of what will be done with the data. People have to think ahead of time, here are my hypotheses, this is my reason for looking at the data. I'm laying this out for myself, it'll be public information, what I, what I predefined, and then you know, a year later or so when the data are published, we, everyone knows what was predefined and what was not, what was more exploratory. The second thing that we've learned is it does require a lot of resources. And I think we, again, the guardrails are important to think about that. And um, finally, I think that we all have been um, excited about the publications that we've seen. But I think, as, as, as was mentioned before, I think we all have to think together what are the resources that go into this and is the juice worth the squeeze? Thank you. OK, uh, to try and get more back on schedule than we are now, uh, we're going to skip the opportunity for you to do an online poll. Uh, instead, I'm just going to acknowledge and thank two other members of the, the committee. Uh, Devin McGraw is in the audience and will be in a subsequent panel. And Dave Demetz is uh, online from uh, uh, Arizona. Sharon, Sharon, Sharon. Sharon Terry is here, and she'll be on a panel later as well. Uh, to follow up on the juice, uh, the squeeze versus juice uh, metaphor, if anyone really wants to test that empirically, just send me a note and you can come pick up all the oranges from our tree and try and make juice out of them. Uh, it's a lot harder than anyone thought. I'm going to ask uh, each of the panelists now to just uh, very quickly leave us with a parting thought. So in a minute or so, just say, what do you want people to think about during the day and talk about uh, the rest of the day? We're going to go in reverse order. Well, we're going to go in different order. Ida, you go first, and then I'll decide where we're going backwards or forwards. Wow. That's a charge. So I will, I will just uh, reflect that charge to the, to the group. I think it's to think about real-world evidence. I think we, you know, it's, it's our safe space to think about clinical trials. We know that. And, and, and as, as Rob said, we're doing that better and better. But, but the light on the lamppost is moving away. And it's a wide open space there. What kind of evidence are we looking for? What are we hoping evidence will do for us? Um, just even epistemologically, should we always be hypothesis driven or not? Coming from the machine learning world, Data-driven is better than hypothesis. Why constrain yourself to a hypothesis? Why not just be open? Um, those, are, those are substantive questions to think about. It's far beyond data sharing. So we're going to go backwards in the alphabet. Jeff, Trace, please. I'm going to disagree with Ida. Um, I think that um, we've seen over and over again the hidden biases in uh, real-world data. People make decisions for reasons. And so I think that the uh, use of randomization as a way of overcoming biases and the need to enroll in clinical trials, a patient spectrum that is consistent with the patient spectrum of people who have the disease, not necessarily people who can afford to, to buy medicines. And if we get those data to widely share them, we can tell the patients when they enroll in a trial, you're not only helping yourself because you're in the trial and you, this may help your condition, you're contributing broadly to the scientific endeavor. You're helping the world improve 
how we care for patients like you. So your brothers and sisters, your children and their children are going to benefit from widespread data sharing. We've gotten to the point where things that used to be very, very difficult are becoming easier and easier because of speed and storage capacity. So let's stop putting up barriers and start figuring out how to build roads. Uh, Artie? Great. So I'm going to agree with both Ida and Jeff in the following way. Um, so I do think that in the um, pre clinical, uh, pre-market, excuse me, um, space, soft law has worked really quite well, and it, more needs to be done on the soft law front, but I'm not sure, actually, despite my noting a hard law um, options, uh, that hard law is as necessary. I do think in the post-market area, and this is where I agree with Ida, um, hard law may well be necessary. So as you probably know, the Biden administration has put out an executive order on AI, and that across all agencies because there is so much going on and so much, as Rob said, so much potentially scary stuff. Um, and I do think that, that their um, hard law will have to play a role because I don't think soft law will be enough. So I just want to leave you with a... Oh, Joanna. <laughs> I'm always last. I, I, I'll be very brief then. I, I guess just to remember the spirit of our report, which was maximizing the benefits and minimizing the risks. The risks are different than they were 10 years ago when we worked on this. The benefits probably are even greater than we imagined, um, but I think it requires a really detailed look. Let's set out new opportunities and new guardrails to protect participants in clinical trial data. So much effort goes into every single randomized clinical trial, let's be sure that we're using the data to maximize medical care and really to minimize the benefit to participants who are counting on us. Just, just signing a consent form is, is not good enough. They're counting on us to protect their privacy. Let me just ask you to keep in mind something that was raised, that Rob Caleb raised and several of the other panelists raised, and that's the wholesale sharing of data through data aggregators uh, without any of the scientific uh, rigorous standards that has characterized uh, clinical trial data sharing. We assume, and I think, uh, Joanne, your example from Yoda is really helpful, that people who are requesting the clinical trials data, if you give them methodological feedback, they take it and they use it to improve their protocols, and they don't publish uh, or disseminate uh, things that totally contradict what they said they were going to do. They're people of goodwill who believe in some form of methodological rigor. So what's the equivalent for people who have a conclusion they want to reach? How do we try to give them access to data, but give them, put guardrails on so they don't just use it to reinforce a predetermined conclusion. Thanks. We'll do a quick shift and next panel.